One. All right, this is part two of chapter 33 of the American Pageant. Uh, the first question that we will focus on, so we're going to start off with the 33.1, the fall of France. The months following the collapse of Poland, while France and Britain's marked time, were known as the phony war. An ominous silence fell on Europe as Hitler shifted his victorious divisions from Poland for a knockout blow of France. An action during this anxious period was relieved by the Soviets, who wantonly attacked neighboring Finland in an effort to secure strategic buffer territory. The debt paying Finns, who had a host of admirers in America, were speedily granted $30 million by an isolationist Congress for non-military supplies. But despite, but despite heroic resistance, Finland was, when Finland was finally flattened by the Soviets. An abrupt end to the phony war came in April 1940, when Hitler again, without warning, overran his weaker neighbors, Denmark and Norway. Hardly pressing for breath, the month he attacked the Netherlands and Belgium, followed by a paralyzing blow at France. By late June, France is forced to surrender, but not until Mussolini had pounced on its rear for a jackal share of the loot. In the pell-mell but successful evacuation from the French port of Dunkirk, the British managed to salvage the bulk of their shattered and partially disarmed army. The crisis prohibitively brought forth an inspired leader and prime minister was in Churchill, the bulldog-jawed orator who served his people to fight off the fearful air bombings of their cities. So in these two paragraphs, you want to understand is that, uh, I mean, both uh, the Soviet Union and also Fr and also Germany were able to kind of expand um, very quickly, right? Uh, Denmark and Norway fall uh, to, uh, yeah, to, um, of course, uh, to Germany, right? Because they're engaged in that lightning war, blitzkrieg. Um, the Luftwaffe is very successful. France is now taken over by Hitler. Uh, Great Britain in the Battle of Dunkirk is able to uh, just escape. France's sudden collapse shocked Americans out of their daydreams. South Harbor Britain is singing, it will always be in England, where all that stood between Hitler and the death of the constitutional government in Europe. If Britain went under, Hitler would have at his disposal the workshops, shipyards, and, sl and slave labor of Western Europe. He might even have the powerful British fleet as well. This frightening possibility, which seemed to pose a dire threat to American security, steeled the American people to a tremendous effort. Roosevelt moved the electrifying energy in dispatch. He called upon an already debt-burdened nation to build huge air fleets and a two-ocean navy, which could also check Japan. Congress jarred out of its, of its athlete towards preparedness. Within a year, appropriated the astounding sum of $37 billion. The figure was more than the total cost of fighting World War I, and about five times larger than the New Deal annual budget. So as a result to the fall of France, the United States would go ahead and start to build up our military. We would go ahead with conscription, which also means a draft. We would spend more than $37 billion, which was more than we had spent in World War I, and also larger than the budget of the New Deal. So we're getting ready to go to war, because if Britain falls to France, or sorry, falls to Germany, uh, that means Hitler would have dominated all of Western Europe. Congress also passed conscription law, approved on September 6, 1940. Under this measure, America's first peacetime draft. Provision was made for training. Each year, 1.2 million troops and 800,000 reserves. That was later adapted to the requirements of a global war. The Latin American bulwark, likewise, needed bracing. The Netherlands, Denmark, and France all crushed under the German jackboot. And orphan colonies in the New World. Would these fall into German hands? At the Havana Conference of 1940, the United States agreed to share the United States agreed to share with its twenty New World neighbors the responsibility of upholding the Monroe Doctrine. The ancient dictum, thereto unilateral, had been a uh, bludgeon brandished only in the Haiti Yankee fist. Now multilateral, it would be wielded by twenty one pairs of American hands, at least in theory. So let's go back to our question here. Um, how Roosevelt and Congress respond to the fall of France? Um, 
I guess you could say preparedness. Uh, we'd go ahead and draft uh, close to a million individuals and 800,000 reserves. We'd also invest a lot of money in our Navy and our Air Force. Refugees from Holocaust. Describe what happened on the night of Kristallnacht. Uh, what happened to the boat of Jewish refugees that left in May 1939 looking for hope? 33.1, refugees from the Holocaust. Aroused by Adolf Hitler, the ancient demon of anti-Semitism brutally bared its fangs. During the late 19th century, Jewish communities in Eastern Europe were frequent victims of pogroms, mob attacks, approved or condoned by local authorities. In modern Germany, Provol violence reappeared with shocking efficiency on the night of November 9, 1938. Instigated by a speech of Nazi propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, mob ransacked more than 7,000 Jewish shops, almost all of the country's synagogues. At least 91 Jews lost their lives, and about 30,000 were sent to concentration camps in the terminal wake of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. So what happens at the night of Kristallnacht is you're getting... Um, Instigated by a speech of Joseph Goebbels, uh, you're getting the Jewish community that's attacked, uh, many losing their lives, and also 30,000 are going to be sent into concentration camps. So crystal knot means broken glass. Um, it refers to the murderous pogrom or uh, pogroms, kind of a Jewish ghetto, right, that destroyed a lot of Jewish businesses and raiding of the synagogues, which was the place of worship. Many Jews attempted to escape Hitler's racist juggernaut. Take one po to take one poison case, in May 39, 937 passengers, almost all of them Jewish refugees, boarded the ship St. Louis in Hamburg and departed for Havana. When they reached Cuba, however, most were denied entry for a lack of a valid Cuban visa. The St. Louis then sailed to Miami, which proved no more hospitable. President Roosevelt briefly showed some interest in accepting the beleaguered passengers, but restrictive immigration laws, together with opposition from Southern Democrats, and Secretary of State Cordell Hull convinced him otherwise. After being turned away one last time in Canada, the St. Louis, the St. Louis eventually deposits its, its passengers in England, France, and Belgium and the Netherlands, where many of them successfully perished under a Nazi heel. After reports of Nazi genocide began to be verified in 1942, Roosevelt created the War Refugee Board which saved thousands of Hungarian Jews from deportation to the notorious death camp at Auschwitz. But all told, only 150,000 Jews, mostly Germans and Austrians, found refuge in the United States. By the end of the war, some 6 million Jews had been murdered in the Holocaust. So in these last two paragraphs, you understand uh, the United States, uh, the role that they played in terms of um, preventing uh, the, Jewish population being, the Jewish population being killed in the um, concentration camps. First example we get is the St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis was a boat that was departing uh, from Hamburg, Germany, and it was denied repeatedly. Uh, the United States denying it. Uh, eventually, it would make its way to back to Europe. However, many of those Jews would find their ways into concentration camps. Uh, Roosevelt sets up the War Refugee Board, as stated in these two paragraphs. However, its role is minimal. Only 150,000 Jews would find refugee compared to the 6 million that would be murdered. Uh, so I definitely went ahead. I answered that. Uh, what happened to the boat of Jewish refugees? I answered that. And what was the night of Kritzel? Not definitely answered that as well. Bolstering Britain. Explain how each of the following events contributed to U.S. isolationism or pulled them out of isolationism. Before the fall of France in June 1940, Washington had generally observed a technical neutrality. But now, as Britain alone stood between Hitler and his dream world domination, the wisdom of neutrality seemed increasingly questionable. Hitler launched air attacks against Britain in August 1940. Preparatory to an, Asia, to an invasion scheduled for September, four months the Battle of Britain raged in the air over the British Isles. The RAF, the Royal Air Force's tenacious defense of its native islands, eventually led, eventually led Hitler to postpone his planned invasion indefinitely. So the RAF was very successful, uh, despite the longevity of the, um, the Battle of Britain. 
During the precarious months of the Battle of Britain, debate intensified in the United States over what foreign policy to embrace. Radio broadcasts from London brought the drama of the nightly German air raids directly into millions of American homes. Sympathy for Britain grew, but it was not yet sufficient to push the United States into war. Roosevelt faced a historic decision, whether to hunker down in the Western Hemisphere, assume a fortress America, defensive posture, and let the rest of the world go it alone, or to bolster, or to bolster beleaguered Britain by all means short of war itself. Both sides had their advocates. Supporters of aid to Britain formed propaganda groups, the most potent of which were the Committee to Defend America by Aiding Allies. Its argument was double-barreled. To interventionists, it could appeal for direct succor to the British by such slogans as, Britain is fighting our, flight, or our fight. To isolationists, it could appeal for assistance to democracies by all methods short of war, so a terrible conflict be kept far away in Europe. So as you can see here, um, of course, Great Britain is left alone to fight Germany. Although there is some success in the Battle of Britain, um, there's many, there's a lot of concern in the United States of whether or not we should say isolationist. Uh, so these last few paragraphs have kind of discussed just the different reasons for why we should and also we should not go to war. The isolationists, both numerous and insincere, were by no means silent. Determined to avoid American bloodshed at all costs, they organized the America First Pro, uh, Pro, uh, sorry, organized America First Committee and proclaimed, America will fight to the last American. They contend that America should concentrate what strength they had to defend its own shores, less the victorious Hitler after crushing Britain, plot a transoceanic assault. Their basic philosophy, their basic philosophy was, the Yanks are not coming, and their most effective speechmaker was a famed aviator, Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh, who ironically had narrowed the Atlantic in 1927. So Charles Lindbergh, of course, um, definitely wants to stay isolationist. Britain was in a critical need of destroyers, where German submarines were threatening to starve it out of the attacks on shipping. Roosevelt moved boldly when on September 2, 1940, he agreed to transfer to Great Britain 50 old model four funnel destroyers left over from WW1. In return, he promised to hand over to the United States eight valuable defense base sites stretching from Newfoundland to South America. These strategically located outposts were to remain under the Stars and Stripes for 90 years. So what we're getting here is in order to provide assistance to Great Britain, uh, our government decides to uh, go ahead and transfer them some old destroyers because they're in need of them because they kept getting killed by the um, or destroyed by the U-boats. In exchange, you would give us uh, a few bases in the Western Hemisphere. Transferring 50 destroyers to a foreign navy was a legally questionable disposal of government property. The exchange was achieved by a simple presidential agreement, without so much as a buy or leave to Congress. Applause, bur applause burst from the aid to Britain ad advocates, many of whom who had been urging such a step. Condemnation arose from America Firsters and other isolationists, as well as anti-administration Republicans. Some of them approved the transfer, but decried Roosevelt's secretive and arbitrary methods. Yet so grave was a crisis that the president was unwilling to submit the scheme to the uncertainties of delays of a full dress debate in Congress. Shifting warships from the neutral United States to a belligerent Britain was beyond question, a flagrant violation of neutral obligations, at least neutral obligations that had existed before Hitler's barefaced aggressions rendered foolish such old-fashioned concepts of fair play. Public opinion polls demonstrate that a majority of Americans were determined, even at the risk of armed hostilities, hostilities to provide battered British with all aid short of war. So this shows, um, once again, the debate between uh, being isolationist or going into war. Uh, although many Americans did not want to go to war, they did feel that it was necessary to provide aid to Great Britain. Okay. Uh, so I apologize. I, these questions are a little bit of, out of order. So we had organization, uh, Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, uh, so their, their contribution was, of course, to uh, provide uh, assistance, right, to uh, America, um, but at the same time, not necessarily go to war. So they would support something, uh, such as the uh, the the providing of um, um, of old used destroyers to Great Britain, 
uh, at the same time, they did not want to go to war. America first, uh, they definitely felt as if that we should be isolationists. Anything that would lean us to war, they were completely against. Appeasing Japan and Germany. A landmark, a landmark land lease law. By 1940, and Britain was near the end of its financial tether. Its credits in America were being rapidly consumed by insatiable war orders. But Roosevelt, who had better memories of the wrangling over the Allied debts in World War I, was determined, as he put it, to eliminate the silly, foolish old dollar sign. He finally hit on a scheme of lending or leasing American arms to the reeling democracies. When the shooting was over, to use his comparison, the guns and tanks could be returned, just as one next their neighbors would return a garden hose when a threatening fire was to put out. But isolationist Senator Taft, who was reputed to have the finest mind of Washington until he made it up, retorted that lending arms is like chewing gum. You don't want it back. Who wants up a chewed up tank? The Lend Lease Bill, patriotically numbered 1776, was entitled An Act to Further Promote the Defense of the United States sprung on the country after the election was safely over. Uh, it was praised by the administration as a device that would keep the nation out of war rather than drag it in. The underlying concept was, send guns, not sons, or billions, not bodies. America, so President Roosevelt promised, would be the arsenal of democracy. It would send the limitless supplies of arms to the victims of aggression, who in turn would finish their job, the war, on the side of the Atlantic. Accounts would be settled by returning the used weapons or their equivalents to the United States when the war was ended. So what the lend lease was basically saying is America would go ahead and lend all the weapons to uh, anyone that was in war uh, if they were fighting for democracy. In return, the weapons or their equivalents would be given back when the war was over. Critics would say, though, why would we want used weapons? lend lease was heatedly debated throughout the Congress. Most of the opposition, most of the opposition, most of the opposition came as might be expected from isolationists and anti-Roosevelt Republicans. The scheme was assailed as a blank check bill. In the world of isolationists, Senator Burton Wheeler, the new AAA Agricultural Adjustment Bill, a measure designed to plow under every fourth American boy. Nevertheless, the lend lease was finally approved in March 1941 by sweeping majorities in both houses of Congress. Lend lease was one of the most momentous laws ever to pass Congress. It was a challenge hurled squarely into the teeth of the Axis dictators. America pledged itself to the extent of its vast resources to bolster those nations that were indirectly defending it by fighting aggression. When the gigantic operation ended in 45, America had sent about fifty billion dollars, fifty billion dollars worth of arms and equipment, much more than the cost of the country of World War One. To those nations fighting aggressors. The passing of Lend-Lease was in effect an economic declaration of war. Now a shooting declaration that could not be very far around the corner. Um, so when you're looking at this, we spent more than $50 billion sending it to those that we felt were defending us. Of course, this is going to be perceived as an act of war by some other states. By its very nature, the Lend-Lease bill marked the abandonment and pretense of neutrality. It was no destroyer deal arranged privately by Roosevelt. The bill was universally debated over drugstore counters, cracker barrels, from California all the way to Maine, and to the sovereign citizen at last spoke through convincing majorities in Congress. Most people probably realized that they were tossing the old concepts of neutrality out the window, but they also recognized that they would play a suicidal game if they found themselves by the ox cart rules of the 19th century, especially while the Axis aggressors themselves openly sprung international obligations. Lend-lease would admittedly involve a grave risk of war, but most Americans were prepared to take that chance rather than see Britain collapse in the face of diabolical, diabolical dictators alone. Lend-lease had somewhat an incident result of gearing U.S. factories for all-out war production. The enormously increased capacity thus achieved helped save Americans' own skin when, at long last, a shooting war burst around its head. Hitler evidently recognized lend lease as an official declaration, as an unofficial declaration of war. Until then, Germany had avoided attacking U.S. ships. Memories of America's device, decisive intervention in 1718 uh, were still fresh in German mind. But after the passing of lend lease, 
there was less point in, in uh, trying to curry favor with the United States. On May 21, 1941, Robin Moore, an unarmed American merchantman, was torpedoed by the German submarine in the South Atlantic outside a war zone. The sinkings had started, but on a limited scale. So as you can see, that Hitler went ahead and perceived Lend-Lease as a uh, declaration of war. Um, and evidence of this is when he goes ahead and he sinks uh, the Robin Moore, which was an American ship. So let's take a look at this. Um, so as we could see here, uh, the neutrality acts. Of course, we're getting 35, 37, 39. Uh, remember what these acts, the purpose of them were to do, were to keep the United States neutral. And what they did was they limited uh, the traveling on a belligerent ship, uh, the loaning of money to anyone that was a belligerent, and also the selling of weapons to that was a belligerent. This is definitely isolationism. It's isolationism because one of the things it's meant to do is to prevent um, showing favoritism in an act of war, but also ensuring that we're not necessarily having any ships that are being sent to someone that is in war where they'll be attacked, just like the Lusitania um, during uh, World War I. The quarantine speech. Uh, this was after Japan went ahead and invaded Manchuria. Uh, what happened? Roosevelt gives a speech saying that Japan and also dictators say it should be quarantined, meaning that they should uh, limited interaction with them, limited trade with them. Um, is this isolationism or not? I would say that many criticized Roosevelt for the speech because they felt that it was getting us one step closer to war. Cash and carry policy. Uh, what this said is that we could go ahead and engage in business with belligerents. However, they would need to carry out the weapons on their own boats and as well as everything would be needed paid in full in cash. Uh, is this one step away from isolationism? It's still isolationist, but compared to the neutrality acts, it's definitely less isolationist as business is now allowed. Lend-lease bill, this is what we just talked about. Uh, the lend-lease bill, of course, look at this lend-lease bill. It goes ahead and says that rather than sending sons, we're going to send guns. Uh, so we are going to let anyone uh, that is a defender of democracy, uh, which is not Hitler, um, to borrow weapons. And in exchange, they could just give us back the weapons when we're done. It's like it's like loaning uh, a tool to your neighbor. Uh, of course, Hitler becomes angry and he starts uh, using U-boats to bomb American merchant ships. So next we'll talk about the Atlantic Ar Carter, Charter, sorry, embargoes and Pearl Harbor. Charting a new world. Two globe-shaking events marked the course of World War II before the assault on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. One was the fall of France in June 1940. The other was Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union almost exactly one year later in June 1941. Scheming dictators Hitler and Stalin had been uneasy yoke fellows under the ill-begotten Nazi-Soviet pact of 1939. As masters of the double cross, neither trusted the other. They engaged in prolonged dickering in a secret attempt to divide potential territorial spoils between them. But Stalin balked at dominant German control of the Balkans. Hitler, thereupon, decided to crush his co-conspirator, seize the oil and other resources of the Soviet Union, and then have two free hands to snuff out Britain. He assumed that his invincible armies could subdue Stalin's Mongol half-wits in a short weeks. Uh, so what these two parents are saying is that it, um, the uh, Nazi-Soviet pact, uh, it was evident that both Hitler and Mussolini had distrust for each other. In short, Hitler attacks Mussolini, or sorry, Hitler and Stalin. Hitler and Stalin um, with this Nazi-Soviet pact. Uh, it's it's evident they don't trust each other. Hitler goes ahead and attacks Stalin. He thinks that he could defeat Stalin's army quite quickly and then go ahead and attack Great Britain. But he learns that this is not true. Out of a clear sky on June 22, 1941, Hitler launched a devastating attack on his Soviet neighbor. This timely assault was an incredible stoke of good fortune for the democratic world, or so it seemed at the time. The two fiends could now slit each other's throats on the icy steps of Russia. Or... They would if the Soviets did not quickly collapse, as many military experts predicted. Sound American strategy seemed to dictate speedy aid to Moscow while it was still afloat. Roosevelt immediately promised assistance and backed up his words in making some military supplies available. Several months later, interpreting the Lend-Lease Law to mean the defense of the USSR was now essential for the defense of the United States, he extended $1 billion in Lend-Lease, the first installment of an ultimate of $11 billion. Meanwhile, 
The valor of the Red Army, combined with the white paralysis of an early Russian winter, had halted Hitler's invaders at the gates of Moscow. So, uh, Moose Stalin's able to um, kind of stop Hitler's army. Meanwhile, the United States is providing an abundance of resources to them. The most memorable offspring of this get-together was the eight-point Atlantic Charter. It was formally accepted by Roosevelt and Churchill and endorsed by the Soviet Union later that year. Suggestive of Wilson's 14 points, the New Covenant outlined the aspirations of democracies for a better world at war's end, arguing the rights of the individuals rather than the nations. The Atlantic Charter laid the groundwork for later advocacy on behalf of universal human rights. Many were surprised by how specific the document was, opposing imperialistic annexations. The Charter promised that there would be no territorial changes contrary to the wishes of the inhabitants. It further affirmed the right of people to choose their own form of government, in particular to regain the governments abolished by dictators. Among various goals, the Charter declared for disarmament and peace of security, pending a permanent system of general security, a League of Nations. So what you're getting here is, um, uh, is that we're getting this Atlantic Conference, which was held in August 1941, right? And this was the first of a, an abundance of conferences, right, that are made um, to not only establish peace after the war, uh, but to also go ahead and explain what's going to happen to the territories that were taken over by dictators. Right. Liberals, uh, liberals, the world took heart. Uh, from the Atlantic Charter, as they had taken are from Wilson's comparable 14 points. It was especially gratifying to subject populations like the Poles, who were being uh, ground under the iron of a heel of a conqueror, but the agreement was wrongly condemned the United States by isolationists and others hostile to Roosevelt. What right, they charged, had neutral America to confer with the belligerent Britain on common policies? Such critics missed a point. The nation was, in fact, no longer neutral. So going over here to Atlantic Charter, um, what this was, uh, this was a conference between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, and what it did was it established what would happen to the countries that were taken over by dictators and all, would also kind of establish the League of Nations. This would not be a symbol of isolationism, specifically because if we were truly neutral, then why would we be meeting? Uh, what, or why would we have any say in terms of what's happening in Europe, right, with the dictators in Europe? Um, so although a lot of liberals were very happy with this, um, they were happy with the sense that it's showing uh, an advocation for human rights. Uh, the biggest issue was with isolationists was that why do we have such a prominent role on the world stage if we are neutral? U.S. destroyers and Hitler's U-boats clash. lend shipments of arms to Britain on British ships were bound to be sunk by German Wolfpack submarines. If the intent was to get the munitions to England, not to dump them in the ocean, the freighters would have to be escorted by U.S. warships. Britain simply did not have enough destroyers. The dangerous possibility of being convoy convoyed into war had been mentioned in Congress during a lengthy debate on land lease. But administration spokesperson had brushed the aid idea aside. The strategy was to only make one commitment at a time. Roosevelt made the fateful decision to convoy in 1941. By virtue of his authority as a commander-in-chief of the armed forces, the president issued orders to the Navy to escort land lease shipments as far as Iceland. The British would then shepherd them the rest of the way. So what a convoy is, is when you're getting merchant ships, they're surrounded by naval ships to make sure that they're protected. Uh, in short, what they're hoping is that these merchant ships are going to go ahead and get to Great Britain to provide them with the resources. That's why he's sending the Navy to protect them. Inevitable clashes with submarines ensued on the Iceland run. Even though Hitler orders, Hitler's orders were to strike an American warships only in self-defense, in September 1941, the U.S. destroyer Greer, proactively trailing a German U-boat, was attacked by the undersea craft. Without damage to either side, Roosevelt then proclaimed a shoot-on-sight policy. On October 17, escorting the destroyer Kearney while engaged in a battle with U-boats, lost 11 men and was crippled but not sent to the bottom. Two weeks later, the destroyer Reuben James was torpedoed and sunk off southern, southwestern island with loss of more than 100 officers and enlisted men. Neutrality was still inscribed on the statute books, but not in American hearts. Congress 
responding to the public measures and confronted with the shooting at war, voted in mid-November 1941 to pull the teeth from now useless neutrality act in 1930 line. Merchant ships could henceforth be legally armed, and they could enter the combat zones with munitions for Britain. Americans braced themselves for wholesale attacks by Hitler's submarines. So as we can see here, it turned into lend lease. Uh, but now what we're getting the 1939 Neutrality Act is no longer void, and merchant ships can now uh, head over to Great Britain and also be armed. Uh, so we're getting these armed scrimmages, although it's not official war. Uh, it's happening with Germany and the United States. Surprise assault on Pearl Harbor. The blow-up came not in Atlantic, but in the faraway Pacific. The explosion should have surprised no close observer for Japan. Since September 1940, had a formal military ally of Nazi Germany, America's shooting foe in the North Atlantic. Japan's position in the Far East had grown more perilous by the hour. It was still mirrored down in costly and exhausting China's incident, from which it would extract neither honor nor victory. Its war machine was fairly dependent on immense shipments of steel, scrap, iron, oil, and aviation gasoline from the United States. Such, such assistance to the Japanese aggressor was highly unpopular in America. But Roosevelt had, had uh, resultantly held off an embargo, lest he goad the Tokyo warlords into descent upon the oil-rich but defense-poor Dutch East Indies. Washington, late in 1940, finally imposed the first of its embargoes on Japan-bound supplies. This blow was followed by, in mid-1941, a freezing of Japanese assets in the United States and a cessation of all shipments of gasoline and other sinews of war. As the oil gods dropped, the squeeze on Japan grew steadily more nerve-wracking. Japan, Japanese leaders were faced with two painful alternatives. They could either knuckle under to the Americans or break out of the embargo ring by a desperate attack on oil supplies and other riches of Southeast Asia. So the United States, of course, is we pass an embargo on Japan. Japan is relying on metal, scrap, iron, and oil. And, in Japan, and the United States goes ahead and not only freezes all assets, all money in Japan, but they also stop trade with them. Uh, Japan needs this if they're going to continue to expand in Asia, right? They're reliant on the United States for this. Final tense negotiations with Japan took place in Washington during November and early December of 1941. The State Department insisted the Japanese clear out of China, but the sweetened appeal offered to renew trade relations on a limited basis. Japanese imperialists, after waging a bitter war against China for more than 40 years, were unwilling to lose face by withdrawing the BS of the United States. Faced with capitulation or confined conquest, they chose the sword. So what we're getting here is the United States is telling Japan to leave China, because remember, we feel it's a violation of their open-door policy. But at the same time, um, we're also concerned about just the humanitarian rights that are being violated in China. Remember, J China is... Uh, being invaded by Japan during this time. Uh, we get things such as the Man King Massacre, right? Um, negotiations fail, right? Uh, Japan refuses to exit China. Officials in Washington have cracked the top secret code of Japanese, knew that Tokyo's decision was for war. But the United States, a democracy, committed to public debate and action by Congress, could not shoot first. Roosevelt, misled by Japanese movements in the Far East, evidently expected the blow to fall on British Malaya, or in the Philippines, no one in high authority in Washington seems to believe that the Japanese were either strong enough or foolhardly enough to strike Hawaii. So we knew that they were going to strike, but we thought that they were going to strike in the Philippines. But the paralyzing blow struck Pearl Harbor. While Tokyo was deliberately prolonging negotiations in Washington, Japanese bombers winging from distant aircraft carriers attacked without warning on the Black Sunday morning on December 7, 1941. It was a debate, as Roosevelt told Congress, which will live in infamy. It was a day that would live in infamy. Um, about 3,000 casualties were inflicted on American personnel. Many aircraft were destroyed. The battleship fleet was virtually wiped out, and all eight of the eight craft were sunk or otherwise immobilized. And numerous small vessels were damaged or destroyed. Fortunately for America, the three priceless aircraft carriers happened to be outside the harbor. An angered Congress the next day officially recognized that war had been thrust upon the United States. The roll call in Senate followed only one short vote of, un of unanimity. Germany, Italy, and allied Japan spared Congress the indecision by declaring war on December 11, 1941. This decision was formally accepted on the same day by unanimous vote of Senate and House. An official war 
Already, her many months duration was now official. So, of course, Japanese embargoes, um, this, this is a stoppage of trade, st uh, ceasing, uh, we also ceased all Japanese assets in the United States, stopped any sending of steel, oil, and also metal scraps, uh, which Japanese was relying on. This was definitely not isolationist. Uh, remember that at this point they had formed an alliance, tripartite alliance with Germany. Uh, this would lead them to go ahead and attack Pearl Harbor, uh, which in turn would lead us to declare war, right? Uh, on Japan, but at the same time, Germany, Italy, they had declared war on us. America's transformation from bystander to belligerent. Japan's Harikiri gamble in Hawaii paid off only to shore one. True, the Pacific fleet was largely destroyed or immobilized, but the sneak attack aroused in United America as almost anything could have done. To the very day of the blow-up, strong majority of Americans still wanted to keep out of war. But the bombs that polarized Pearl Harbor blasted isolationists into silence. The only thing left to do, growled isolationist Senator Wheeler, was to lick the hell out of them. But Pearl Harbor was not the full answer to the question the United States went to war. The treacherous attack was but the last explosion in a long chain. Following the fall of France, Americans were confronted with the devil's dilemma. They desired all but to stay out of the conflict, yet they did not want Britain to be knocked out. They wished to hold Japan's conquest in the Far East, conquest that menaced not only American trade and security, but international peace as well. <laughs> to keep Britain from collapsing, the Roosevelt administration felt compelled to extend the unmutual aid that invited attacks from German submarines. To keep Japan from expanding, Washington undertook to cut off vital Japanese supplies with embargoes. Rather than let democracy die and dictatorship rule, most citizens were evidently to support the policy that might lead to war, and it did. So all in all, what this paragraph was saying was um, it was evident at the fall of France that we were getting closer and closer into war, whether it's conscription, the building of our uh, Navy and Air Force right after the fall of France, uh, whether it's the Lend-Lease Act when we're now providing ships to uh, uh, and also resources to those that were against democracy or that, that those that were uh, in support of democracy. Uh, to the embargo in Japan, it was evident that we are definitely uh, going to make our way into war.